Well, we have some bold initiatives that we're going to try and do, and that is that we need, from a scientific standpoint, to get drugs that might actually ultimately get the virus so low that you don't have to treat people for the rest of their lives, to be able to get people treated early, treated aggressively, and get to the point where, I hate to use the word cure because it gets taken out of context, but to be able to be so good with the drugs that you can actually functionally cure someone. So that by that I mean not necessarily eradicate every vestige of the virus from the body, but at least allow that you can withdraw therapy and the person's own body defense mechanisms will allow that person to go without therapy. That's the thing that I see for the future. The other thing I see is massive preventive measures. Right now we have good prevention, but it, it's not accessible to the people who need it. We've got to do a much better job of getting prevention modalities to the people who need it. So the combination of better drugs being very aggressive in suppressing that virus with preventing the spread of infection is what I see in the next couple of decades as some major advances in a field that has already seen major advances. When you saw the landmark uh, bill around stem cell right. uh, by Obama, it was almost as if we relive part of that energy and the forcefulness around HIV AIDS. What, do you see anything going on there? What is, the, is there an analogy to be made at all? You know, I'm not so sure because okay. I, I think what we have with, with the stem cell uh, um, executive order from the president is to now allow scientists a much greater flexibility uh, in their approach towards using stem cells uh, to at least probe into whether or not it might be applicable to disease. When you have restrictions on a, a finite number of cell lines, a lot of good has come from that, but you can amplify that by giving opportunity to have, have accessibility to many, many more lines. When you're speaking to a male audience or groups of HIV AIDS activists, the questions, what am I missing? <laughs> what am I missing in the conversation? And what's in, what's important for the GQ reader to know? With regard to HIV AIDS, yeah. uh, that it's not over. You know, when when you have breathtaking successes in a disease and you get used to the level of those successes, if you go back and you talk about fast forward, well, they'll backtrack for a decade and a half into the mid 80s when you would go to downtown New York in the village or the Castro in San Francisco and the majority of the gay men in that community were infected. Most of the people ultimately would go to hospice or die at home or go to the hospital and die. It was a horrible situation. Now that we have people on therapy where they can walk around looking well, feeling well, leading relatively normal lives, don't forget the epidemic, the pandemic is not over. We still have 56,000 new infections each year in the United States. There are 1.1 million people who are infected, 21% of whom don't know that they are infected. And those are the ones that inadvertently infect other people. So that's just in the United States. Globally, there are 33 million people, 90% of whom are in the developing world who have HIV infections. So there's a lot to do. I always use a, a terminology when I talk, and it's the title of many of my discussions, much accomplished, but much, much more to do.